Hi everyone, welcome to the live broadcast. Um, my name is Nadia. I'm project director with Internews in Malaysia, and I'm also a freelance environmental journalist. So I'll just introduce a bit more on what this broadcast is going to be about. Sorry. Sure. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. So the Earth Journalism Network or EGN is a project of Internews and the Stanley Center for Peace um, and Security have brought 22 journalists from developing countries to cover COP26 here in Glasgow as part of the Climate Change Media Partnership Program. This is an annual fellowship to the Climate Change Conference uh, whereby the CCMP organizers believe that it is critical for journalists from low and middle income countries to have the opportunity to report live from COP26, which represents a pivotal moment in the global fight to, um, in the global fight to combat climate change. But of course, this year, uh, it is a bit more difficult because of COVID-19 and also the travel restrictions. So this broadcast, we hope, uh, will help journalists covering COP26 remotely. So from today until November 13th, we will host this broadcast for half an hour, in which every day we'll touch on a different theme we will feature three speakers, uh, first year trainer, and then fellow from the CCMP program and an external speaker. And today, today's theme is loss and damage. Um, and we have um, James Fan here, who is the global director of Internews Environmental Programs and Ex executive director of Internews Earth Journalism Network. Next, we will have Rishka Padikar from India. And we're hoping to have Dr. Salimul Haq, who is the senior associate climate change uh, from the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. So I will have James here as our first speaker. So a bit about James. He's the Global Director of Internews Environmental Programs uh, and the Executive Director of Internews Earth Journalism Network, which is a global community of over 14,000 members from 180 plus countries who cover environmental topics. He is a journalist who has primarily focused on environmental, climate, and science issues in developing countries, and also a lecturer at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism, where he teaches a graduate level class on international environmental reporting. So welcome, James, the first broadcast that we're having here. Like, Thank you so much. Great. It's an honor to be here to, uh, to kick things off. So James, you have covered um, 15 COPs to date. So based on your experience and also um, what you've been observing for more than a decade, um, what are you actually looking out for here at COP in terms of headlines? And uh, what are some of the areas that are worth watching and some story ideas that you are pursuing as well? Sure. Well, um, it's uh, I think it's been so far a pretty typical COP in that there's a lot of uh, negotiations going on, a lot, you know, the expected disagreements over where things are going. But what's in, been interesting so far is that we had a bunch of initial agreements come out at the very beginning of the COP. We had, I think they tried to organize things a little differently this year with some of the high level leaders, including President Biden and, and uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson coming here early on in the COP. And uh, they um, announced some major initiatives, including uh, major initiatives on reducing use of coal, on reducing methane emissions. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, and also uh, kind of a, a, a global agreement on managing forests and try uh, that will seek to halt deforestation by the year 2030. Uh, these, you know, pretty um, promising deals. Um, of course, you always have to see how they're going to play out. But I know, for instance, that uh, the negotiators have been trying to reach a global agreement on forests for many, many years now. So the fact that they they seem to have found some kind of agreement is is quite promising. So I think uh, that was kind of, you know, the way the organizers set things up is they wanted to announce these deals in the beginning, give a sense of optimism, and that may have helped uh, get things going. But there's a lot more to be done. Um, if you understand the uh, the way these summits are set up, this was supposed to be the next major summit after Paris, after the Paris Agreement, after five years. 
countries are supposed to get together to increase their ambitions, offer new commitments, nationally determined contributions uh, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so we're still waiting to see how that will all play out. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that process if, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you did mention about these big pledges and commitments that have been made um, last week. So in terms of um, journalists reporting this kind of developments, um, what are some of the key questions that journalists need to look out for when they are reporting on whether COP26 is a success? Because obviously there's um, been some write-ups where um, they are saying, um, they are reporting that you know so certain scientists, certain activists are already claiming that COP26 is a failure. So as journalists, like what are some of the key, key questions they need to ask, um, you know, just to, to see where the direction of this uh, summit is going? Yeah, well, I don't think you can judge a summit till it's over. I mean, we're only halfway through. So this is a stage usually where there's a lot of disagreement and, uh, you know, the, uh, the bureaucrats, if you like, the technocrats have kind of reached the end of their their limit and they've done what they can do now they're going to turn over whatever they have to the ministers as they come in and hopefully the ministers can come to some kind of high level agreement um, so what should we be looking out for basically we want to look at the commitments the nationally determined contributions the ndcs to use the acronym um, that countries make for the summit and those are going to be tallied up to see how close they would get us to limiting global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial limits. That is really the target that the UN has agreed, you know, has, 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 uh, is aiming for is to keep climate change, keep, keep the average global temperature from rising more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're already at 1.1 degrees Celsius. The, contributions from Paris, when you look at them, they don't really get us close to where we need to be. They got us closer, but there's still estimates say it's like 2.7 degrees, uh, maybe three degrees over pre-industrial average temperature, and that would be catastrophic. So we need to see what are the contributions that countries commit to. And in order to get to those, and there's, there's more, you know, how are countries going to get to those contributions, right? I mean, it's one thing for a government to come here and say, yes, we're going to reach, you know, net zero by a certain year. How are they actually going to do it? Do they have a plan? Because oftentimes, let's face it, they don't. Um, and, you know, and then also the thing that people often look at is what are the financial commitments? Because we know that especially for, you know, uh, low and middle income countries, they're going to need international financing to reach those commitments. And so we need, you know, we need to keep an eye on what are those, what, what finances are being offered. And that's a very big deal. Uh, thank you. I think for the last question uh, from me is that I, we know that there are a lot of journalists who will be covering COP for the first time, like myself, and especially with the CCMP program, there are also several journalists who will be covering um, COP for the first time. So based on our experience, um, do you think that COP26 will conclude with a new treaty or a big win just based on your experience and maybe some of your observations? Do you, can you sense where, you know, COP26, where is it heading this time? Uh, you know, uh, I hesitate to get in the prediction business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have to believe there's a lot of momentum right now. Um, you know, it often depends who's in office at a certain time. Uh, I think over the last year, we've seen a lot of uh, extreme weather events hit many countries, not just, you know, in the global south, but also in Europe and, and in the US and other, you know, wealthier countries. So I think uh, governments all over the world are starting to take it more seriously, whether that can turn into real action, real commitment here. I think there's you know, cautious optimism, but it's not like, uh, you know, it's not going to be, um, there's going to be pitfalls along the way. Yeah, it's going to be, um, you know, and even what, if there is an agreement, it's going to be really important for journalists 
to you know follow what their governments have committed to, make sure they live up to the, those commitments, hold governments accountable. Uh, so not just during the COP, but really the real work begins after the summit and making sure that we uh, governments do live up to these commitments. Um, thank you, James. And um, I just want to remind our uh, those who are joining this live broadcast, if you have any question for James, um, please just put them into the chat box and we will get him to answer your questions. Um, do we have questions coming in now? Okay. The question was not very clear who who has the main responsibility in addressing climate change. So um, a question we have uh, is who has the main responsibility to address climate change? Um, maybe James, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, if you, you know, that's a tricky uh, question because you could look at who is emitting the most greenhouse gases right now. That would be China, followed by US and then the EU and India. Um, but if you look historically, then, you know, US and probably Europe are leading the pack. So, you know, people will uh, disagree on that based on their viewpoint. Um, I think the, the point is now that we're in such a dire situation that we all have to kind of step in. And I know that's not always fair. Some, one of the main problems with climate change is that some of the most vulnerable people and you know who are gonna be hurt the most are actually least responsible for it. And, and um, But I think it's important at this point for all governments to make some commitment, you know, some more ambitious commitment if we're going to get close to addressing this challenge. And uh, so, yeah, so, yeah. So I think my, my last question to you would be, um, after covering, you know, uh, so many COPs over the last few years, how do you find new story ideas, um, you know, for, for each conference that you're attending? Um, what are some of the things that excite you or maybe no longer excite you and you're looking at, you know, different angles this time? Yeah. Uh, I'm always, yeah, I have certain issues that I'm always interested in. I, I really like uh, to follow issues about the ocean and marine issues. So I'm always looking for uh, stories about uh, climate change impacts on the ocean and what we can do about it. I'm interested in climate change impacts on health. I think that's a very underreported topic, you know? Um, and we need to do a lot more reporting on health impacts because that affects people very personally. Uh, so I think, you know, when you're trying to reach your audience, you need to think about what are the issues that hit home that affect them most directly. And I think health is one of those things. Um, and then there are some really interesting new issues coming up now, like the recovery to COVID-19 pandemic, right? We know we've been through this awful pandemic for almost two years now. Um, Governments are starting to invest in their economies to bring us out of the economic uh, difficulties we face. What are they gonna invest in? Are they gonna continue to invest, invest in fossil fuels? Are they gonna continue to subsidize fossil fuels? Or are they going to invest in renewable energy and in adaptation and resilience and those things that will help us have a more green recovery? So we're looking a lot of that at, at those issues. I know there have been big developments in the U.S. They just passed an infrastructure bill, um, and I'm sure you know many countries are looking at stimulus packages from their governments for their economies. So I think it could be a really interesting issue for all of you journalists: is what do those stimulus packages look like? What do those investments look like? And um, you know, we'll see how it turns out. Well, thank you very much, James. It was a pleasure to have you for our very first broadcast here at COP26. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we will have a journalist uh, from India. So Rishika is a Bengaluru-based freelance journalist. She covers climate change and wildlife conservation, and she's in Glasgow covering the conference for India's The Wire. Hi, thank you for having me. Okay. So um, maybe you can um, just let everyone know what are um, you hoping to get out of COP um, and maybe what 
what are you here to basically pursue? Like, are there any names in your list or maybe story angles that you are looking at? Yeah. So this is my first COP. So my primary aim is to understand what happens here. Uh, because it's a lot of countries coming together, trying to negotiate how they'll grow in the next few decades, trying to negotiate how it can, how green it can be, how much development space there needs to be, uh, how the planet cannot afford more emissions. So it's a lot of negotiation on a lot of aspects, including economics and trade. Uh, and it's, it's pretty complex. And so many countries have so many different histories, uh, different realities. So my aim... Uh, here primarily is to understand what happens at COPS. So, and because this is my first one, I just want to get the foundation right. Uh, but in terms of stories, I am doing a few stories specifically on finance and carbon markets. So I want to understand how finance flows and uh, carbon markets. I'm also particularly interested in them because I'm, I'm a wildlife reporter. I want to know what happens to our forests if there are carbon markets. So yeah, these two topics are what I'm exploring. Uh, so please, uh, maybe you could just explain like your thought process, um, you know, as a, as a journalist who always covers wildlife and conservation. So what are some of the key headlines you're looking out for while you're at COP? Because obviously every journalist has their own focus. So what are some of the stories um, that you're looking at um, where you, you know, kind of want to link it back to wildlife and conservation since those are most of the kind of writings that you've been doing? Yeah, so like I said, carbon markets is one because wildlife carbon markets means you'll be relying on sinks, on carbon sinks like forests. And ideally, even grasslands should be a part of that conversation, wetlands, grasslands, all kinds of natural ecosystems. Many of them act as carbon sinks. So if, if there's a big headline on carbon markets, I would first think what impact will this have on forests, on grasslands, on wetlands? So that's what I'll be looking at. And apart from carbon markets, finance is the other uh, the other topic because I'm from India, I'm from the global south. So any any action that you would demand from developing countries, it's completely reliance on, reliant on how much finance is mobilized to, to actually enable these efforts. So yeah, these two topics I'm specifically looking at, even from the wildlife conservation angle. So what are some of the things that have been, uh, that have surprised you uh, while you're here at COP as you're pursuing these stories? Are there any kind of new insight that you've been getting just you know, looking at the various events that we have here at COP and how does that help you um, in, in doing your stories as a journalist? So generally, the way things have been going in terms of outcomes or lack of outcomes, that's not surprising to me because many people have told me this before that this is how it works. Uh, but what I have been surprised by is how much happens here and how much you can learn just by observation. So you can see some journalists talking to some other people. You can see some groups negotiating. You can go to the offices of the negotiating group, see how they function. Just in terms of understanding what really goes on here, that has actually surprised me because I didn't think I would learn, actually get to observe and learn so much. But in terms of outcomes or uh, whatever lack of outcomes, that's not really that surprising. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rishika. Um, thank you. So we will have our next speaker. who is uh, he's here. So Dr. Salim Mulha is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh, and is an expert on the links between climate change and sustainable development, particularly from the perspective of developing countries. He was the lead author of the chapter on adaptation and sustainable development in the third assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and was the lead author of the chapter on adaptation and mitigation in the IPCC's fourth assessment report. He's researching the least developed countries' vulnerability to climate change and has attended every COP since 1995. So it is a pleasure and an honor to have you here, Dr. Salim. So um, let me just start by asking you this question. So you've proposed for discussions on loss and damage to have a separate category for financing. Can you explain why this distinction is important? So on financing, what we have already is the promise or pledge made six years ago in Paris for $100 billion a year from the rich countries to help the poor countries do mitigation and adaptation. That's what the money was supposed to be for. They didn't deliver it. They didn't give the $100 billion, So we're uh, still um, expecting that. 
Um, but in the meantime, we now have a third problem, which is the impacts of climate change already happening right now as we speak. And so that cannot be prevented by mitigation or adaptation anymore. And, and the losses are happening, damage is occurring. And so people need to be the victims of those loss and damage, you need to be given some respite, uh, some compensation if possible. And that's what we are asking for here in COP26. Uh, the developed countries are very reluctant to do it. None of them have agreed to do it yet, but we shall see what they say. So um, as a journalist, I think maybe the topic of loss and damage itself can be a bit overwhelming just because it's very broad mm -hmm. and the discussion of you know who is impacted the different onsets of disasters the scale mm -hmm. and um also the various players and stakeholders uh it can be very difficult for journalists to report this topic sure. well so what do you think are some of the issues in loss and damage that are maybe still being unreported or even misreported do you think? sure so first of all let me um point out a very important um scientific report that came out in the last few months which is the sixth assessment report of the intergovernmental panel on climate change who prepare these uh, uh, um, periodic assessment reports and the report of the working group one who are the scientists who track climate change came out on the 9th of august and over the last 30 years these scientists have never said before what they said this time which is they can now tell the impacts of climate change is happening. They can verify the impacts of climate change because the temperature has gone up by over one degree because of greenhouse gas emissions, because of the rich countries. This is no longer something that's going to happen that we have to anticipate or prepare for, but something that is already happening. So what does that mean in practice? It means that from now on, any major record-breaking weather event if it's a flood or a cyclone or a typhoon or a heat wave or a drought that is bigger and worse than anything that we had before and we are seeing one record broken every day somewhere in the world that is no longer natural it's not happening because of natural causes it's happening it may be happening because of natural causes but it's becoming worse because of climate change and so the impacts of these new events, severe events, are not just natural anymore. There is a human involvement in it, human responsibility. And the big polluting countries and the big polluters have that responsibility. They should accept that and do something to help the victims. So essentially, it is about um, explaining and then showing how it can be done, the polluter pay principle. The UN Framework Convention is not a development assistance treaty. It's polluter treaty. It's about pollution caused by polluters. And now we are seeing victims of that pollution. Before we didn't see them, now we are seeing them. And so what we are asking for is that the polluters pay the victims for the loss and damage that they are causing. Thank you. Um, so maybe with uh, journalists from developed countries in mind, what are your tips for them on how to navigate this topic and this debate considering that it's so politically contentious, um, especially when we're talking about concepts like fairness and equity, and uh, what should journalists pay more attention to and maybe avoid when writing or covering this, these topics and concepts? So one of the big um, transitions that has occurred in the very recent time, I would say the last year, is that this issue of impacts used to be thought of as they are only happening or will only happen in the poor countries with the poor. And the poor countries are asking the rich countries to give them money and compensation. That has changed completely. Even before we arrived in Glasgow in the last few weeks, we saw major floods in Germany, killed nearly 200 German citizens, lost their lives. 30 billion euros was the cost of that flood in Germany. It was a small flood. It wasn't a very big flood. Uh, similarly, in the United States, they had a hurricane, Hurricane Ida. It hit the coast of Louisiana and it traveled all the way up to New, Jer New Jersey and New York. It flooded the New York subway system. It killed 51 people in New Jersey. They died, they lost their lives in the United States of America. And the cost of that is in the billions of dollars. So that is real cost of loss and damage from human induced climate change in Germany and in the US. So every journalist in every country, developed or developing, 
needs to understand that. These are not just normal events anymore. They are human caused events. Mm -hmm. And therefore the humans who caused it have some responsibility. Do you feel there are maybe some um, underreported topics within uh, you know, loss and damage that maybe you feel uh, journalists can maybe cover a bit more on? I mean, not just for COP, but maybe beyond the conference itself. Absolutely. In fact, to me, the issue of loss and damage from climate change is uh, universal and all the time. It's not, not, in fact, the COP part of the story is a very small part of the story. The real story is happening on the ground. And I'll give you an example. I mentioned the hurricane in the United States. In the US, I saw a figure recently that one third of the population in the last year alone have been affected by climatic events. I mentioned the, fl the flooding associated with Hurricane Ida. There have been other hurricanes. There were wildfires in California that have caused devastation. So one third of the US population have been hit by climate change. But that population doesn't even know about climate change. They think it's just a weather event. Okay, it was just another weather event. They don't know it was climate change. Unlike the rest of the world, in Germany, they know. When Germany got hit by the floods, I, I was watching the you know wall-to-wall -wall television coverage. And the people in Germany, when they were asked, they said climate change, it's climate change. They know climate change. In America, they don't. And that is a function of journalists and media informing their publics about these, the reality of things. Um, I have another question for you. So what do you think should be done to encourage more attribution studies to prove correlation between climate change and extreme events? So this is a branch of science called attribution science. And it used to be a fairly weak branch in that we, the scientists who did this, they ran models. They would say, you know, by 2050, something is going to happen or 2100, something is going to happen. But immediately, if there was a flood and you said, is this climate change? They would say, well, we don't know. Now they say we know. Okay, Now they are uh, increasing their capacity to understand an event in real time while it's happening. And they did that recently for Hurricane Ida in the US that I mentioned and the floods in Germany. The scientists who study this said these were made worse because of human-induced climate change, which has already caused temperature to rise more than one degree. And that is called attribution science and it's getting very good and it's becoming very speedy. So now, as soon as there's a major event like that, the journalist should ask the scientists, tell us, is this climate change? Or if so, how much of it is caused because of climate change? And the scientists will now be able to tell you. And, and what do you think about um, you know, emerging kind of uh, stories that have been covered maybe on the data that you mentioned earlier about impact? and also um, this holistic approach that people are talking about. Um, how best can journalists cover those topics as well? So one of the aspects of loss and damage that I would encourage journalists to get to learn about and know more about and report more about um, is the non-economic costs. And we, we focus a lot on how much money is it, did it cost in economic terms, but there's a lot of non-economic loss. There are loss of cultures, loss of uh, you know, uh, temples and, and graveyards of people's families. Uh, these are immeasurable. No amount of money will bring them back. Uh, so not everything can be reduced to economic loss. We tend to do that because it's easy to do, but it sometimes is not the most important thing. People lose their, their family members, their, their heritage, their culture. Those are important non-economic losses. Uh, that uh, I would encourage journalists to learn more about and report more on. Uh, maybe we could, do we have any questions from? Yeah, quite a few, but maybe just one last okay. question. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a general question on what is the progress of COP26 and COP27 mm -hmm. in terms of the impact that it's having on the global environment? Okay, so we have a, a question from the audience who wants to know uh, your opinion on what's uh, how's the progress on COP26 so far. So in COP26, we have two levels of issues being debated here on loss and damage. There is a technical level where progress has been good. It's called the Santiago Network on Loss and Damage. They've been negotiating that for the last uh, few days. I think day before yesterday, they went up to midnight at the negotiators and they've got reasonably good agreement. It's a technical uh, uh, um, body and the discussion is about how will it work? What will it do? Who will manage it? And that has made progress. But that is a very technical part of the problem. Uh, the bigger part of the problem is loss and damage is happening and who's going to pay for it? Right now, the people who are suffering are paying. 
none of the rich countries or none of the polluters are willing to pay anything. So that is still a, a active demand from the vulnerable countries to the rich countries, put some money on the table that they have not yet responded to. We'll see, we have five more days to go. Uh, we shall try and move them in those five days. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Salimu, for your time. I, it was a pleasure to have you here. Today. You're welcome. I hope that was useful. Okay. Good. So, so we will end this broadcast today uh, with uh, just to remind everyone here that you may find the resources for COP26 on our website at uh, www.earthjournalism.net slash COP26. And the recording of this will be available on the same website. And for tomorrow's theme, we will have green technology, renewable energy, and innovation. So thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank